Good evening. I'm John Stern, the board chair of the Filson. I'm so glad that you've joined us for tonight's lecture, both in person and virtually. Thank you again for joining us for Lights of Mankind, Earth at Night as Seen from Space with Doug Keeney. Doug Keeney is a historian, researcher, speaker and author of more than a dozen books. Uh, he told me, I believe 18 now, uh, on American history. After spending 16 years as an advertising executive at many of the top advertising agencies, including Yug and Rubicon, he launched Douglas Keeney and Company, a publishing and production firm that includes content creation for cable television networks and book packaging. In 92, Keeney co-founded the military now Discovery Communications and hosted the series on Target. He is probably best known for unearthing the official U.S. manual on how the government would function after a de devastating nuclear attack, the basis for his book by the same name, The Doomsday Scenario, excerpted by the New York Times. This was followed by the first exhaustive history of the air war against Nazi Germany in the bestseller, The Point Bank Directive. The 11th Hour was another bestseller and was widely reviewed as groundbreaking and comprises unseen diaries and logs chronicling Franklin Roosevelt's trip in 1943 to the Yalta Conference. He is also the author of the Lost Histories of World War II book series. He appeared, he has appeared on the Discovery Channel, CBS, PBS, and the Learning Channel. Keeney earned his bachelor's and master's from the University of Southern Cal. During his years in marketing, he won numerous awards for new product development. However, his greatest claim to fame is being the son of the late Dr. Virginia Keeney. I will return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. If you have a question, please come to the microphone at the front of the room, or if you're joining us virtually, drop them in chat. Also after the Q&A, uh, he has a, uh, several books, Why We Fight, his newest book, that he'll have for signing uh, after the Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Doug Keeney. Thanks, John. I don't know who you were describing. He sounds like a very accomplished guy, so it can't really be me. Uh, if you can bring the lights down up here, and before we get started, I just want to make sure everybody can see that little green dot up there. We're going to be using that in this presentation. Lights of Mankind is a trip up to the International Space Station, and we're going to go up there, and we're going to look back down at Earth, much as the astronauts do on a daily basis. We're going to look at photography of Earth at night from space, and we're going to see how humans habitated Earth through that photography. Uh, what we'll be looking at is from this book, Lights of Mankind. It's a coffee table book, which is a little bit unusual for me. Uh, as John said, I've written several other books. Uh, most of them are nonfiction histories of events that shaped America or the world. My most recent book is a book you see up here on the right, The Lives They Saved. And that book's a book about the EMS, the medics, who on September 11th helped 2,000 people to safety, and who with the mariners on 9-11 helped evacuate 250,000 people from New York City by boat. So you may wonder, what is a person who writes nonfiction histories doing writing a a coffee table book that's photo illustrated. And the answer to that is sort of like the answer to all questions today. This book came about because of a tweet. And that tweet is what you see up here. One of the astronauts, whoops, sorry, one of the astronauts on the space station tweeted this photograph of Earth at night. And it, to me, it looked like something I'd seen before. And yet, if you look over here on the left, 258 newspapers picked it up as if it had never been seen before. So I called up NASA, as any author would, and I said, 
what's going on? I feel like I've seen this picture before. And they said, boy, do we have a story for you. And the long story short of that story is that the space station, which you see here, is actually a series of tin cans or cylinders that have been taken up by the space shuttle and bolted together in space to create this massive structure that we have 238 miles above the face of the Earth. The problem with cylinders is that they don't like to have windows cut into them. Windows just compromise the structural integrity of a cylinder. And because of that, until this photograph was tweeted, the astronauts had to operate through portholes. Now, portholes are good. I'm so sorry about that. Portholes are good for taking photographs of Earth by day, but to compensate for the 14,700 mile per hour travel of the space shuttle, uh, of the space station, uh, you ended up with photographs that look largely like Rorschach tests, that look largely like this. Now, in the foreground, we have a couple of of, of, uh, of Soyuz capsules on the space station, but here is what it looked like to take a picture through a porthole of Earth from the space station. However, um, the Italian said, we've got a better idea. Let's design something we can bolt onto the side of the space station. We'll put five big windows in it, and we'll give the astronauts this 50 yard line view of Earth through the main front window of what they called the cupola. And as you can imagine, it was an immediate hit. This is astronaut Sandy Magnus. She's not sitting in the cupola, she's floating in the cupola. And she is doing what astronauts started to do the minute this was attached to the space station. And that is just get away. Just get up into the cupola, contemplate the world, and just be apart from the activity in the space station. It's very confined on the space station. We'll see a picture of that in just a moment. Other astronauts went up there with their cameras and started taking more beautiful photographs of Earth by day. But now they had room, as you can see, to swing the camera so they could compensate for the motion of the space station. And so we went from a photograph of this, which is Florida, to this. Crisp, clear, here we have Miami, Tampa St. Pete, Orlando, you can even see the drop out the dark spot of Disneyland, Disney World. Here's Jacksonville. And if you go on up the Eastern seaboard, you see Savannah and Charleston. You see distinguishing characteristics of the cities and you see actually the grids of the streets in the cities. This was the difference the cupola made and why photography from Earth at, from space became so popular so quickly. So I did what anybody would do. Uh, up here, if you can see it, I called up my agent I said, I think we've got a book. Would you call some publishers? He did. We had three offers. Well, we took one. Uh, we then call, I then called NASA on the left here. I said, can I get access to your image server? And they said, yes, I had to file some papers, but it wasn't too complicated. And then I called the other half of NASA, which is in Houston, which is a human space flight center. And I said, can I get as access to your astronauts? I don't think I should be the sole voice. I think we should hear what they have to say about Earth at night from space. And they said, sure, I had to file some papers, but they said yes. And so I got access to the image servers and I got access to seven astronauts who did participate in the book. And over the course of the next year, I got a 175,000 photographs with no labels on them. So I did what anybody would probably do, which is look for dark spots because dark spots are areas that are not habitated. And I would take something like this, which all of us can tell is what? The Great Lakes, right? Here's Chicago, here's Detroit, Cleveland. I would take something like this, the Great Lakes, the dark spots being the key things that help me guide me on making a decision of what it is. And I would simply marry it to a map. That was pretty easy, but there were other things that helped me identify cities, for instance, rivers. Rivers are going to be dark spots well, and as you know, most major cities of the world were built alongside waterways, so rivers were very helpful, and here we have a river going through the city, and here we have a, dark, a bright white spot, which you'll see in some of the other photographs, and that's a dead indicator that it's a dense urban core, so we know that's probably the center of whatever city this is. Now, I'm a pilot. And you may think that we pilots want a big, bright airport so we can find it at night. 
Well, in fact, we don't. We want a nice dark airport so we don't have lights in our eyes as we're landing. And here we have the characteristic rectilinear stripes of a runway, two parallel runways, and a circular concourse. Does that ring a bell to anybody? That's Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. This would be the Trinity River. And here is a puzzling splotch of green, which really threw me off. So I called up the Dallas Chamber of Commerce because they really didn't want to make a mistake in a book that was going to be sold to tens of thousands of people. I said, what's with the green? And they said, well, it's a civic thing. So a lot of our buildings are outlined in green. And in fact, we do it more and more often. And when they saw that it was visible from space, they started making it more and more of a civic event. So Dallas from space now looks green. So as I said, dark spots are really helpful in identifying places um, from space at night, because uh, we know there's nothing there. That's a lake, it's a river, it's an ocean, it's a desert. I want you all to help me identify this lake. Now I'm gonna give you one clue. It is a lake that has a very close connection to Louisville, Kentucky, and it's not in America. It's in Europe. It, it, who said that? There you go. So we're looking at Lake Geneva. It straddles two, co two countries. Up here is Montreux, Switzerland, which is where Queen, the recording band, recorded all their music up in here in Montreux. Over here is Evian, France, which comes bottled water. And over here in this tip is Geneva. And the connection we have to Geneva is this fountain. Does anybody remember 30 years ago? when we put a fountain in the Ohio River. It didn't last because of debris and currents and so on, but that's right, we wanted to have a fountain like we had in Lake Geneva. Now, we also see when we view Earth at night from space, things that define concepts and facts in ways that we haven't been able to define them before. Do we know what we're looking at here? The River Nile, that's right. So here's the River Nile. Here's Valley of the Kings, right? And up here is Cairo. And up here, over here is Alexandria. And we have the Sinai Peninsula. But what fact do those lights illuminate? 85% of the population of Egypt lives on the River Nile. And it's something we see at night that we just don't see during the day. Here's the rest of Egypt, largely uninhabited. But 85% of the population is right here on the River Nile. We see some other things. Let's take a different view of this. There's a thing called the Levant. The Levant means the rising. If you are in here, oh, here's just the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Eastern tip of the Mediterranean Sea. Here we have the River Nile and Cairo again. If you go all the way over here to Rome and you get up in the morning and you look to your East, you're gonna see three things, right? You're gonna see the sunrise, the rising, you're gonna see where mankind rose, the Tigris and the Euphrates River here in the East. And you're gonna see the birthplace of three of the world's major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Muslim. All of this is what we mean by the Levant, this stretch of land right here. But let's look at that stretch of land one more time. That stretch of land is where a lot of tension resides in the Middle East. Again, here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the tip of the Nile, and this is the Levant. This stretch of land is crowded. Back here is the desert, where it's 120 degrees in the summer. Here is the Mediterranean, where it's brackish. These people live right here in this stretch of land, and those countries are the source of great international conflict and tension. Look who's here on the Levant. We have Beirut, Lebanon. Damascus, Syria, Amman, Jordan, all crowded into the Levant, Tel Aviv, the Gaza Strip, Jerusalem right here, there's Jerusalem, with their backs to this desert and their face to the Mediterranean Sea, little wonder, crowded into this strip of land called the Levant, where we have so many tensions in the world. We also see some other things. We see a perspective on the consequence of war. Now, you may remember in Syria, ISIS came down and invaded Syria, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, and they took over Aleppo, if you remember that. Do you remember Aleppo? So I want to show you Aleppo before the war, and I want you to look at it now. Here's Aleppo. I want you to watch it after the war. 
it virtually disappears. I'm gonna go back and do that again. Aleppo before the war. And we're gonna see the consequence of war as Aleppo, as people just leave Aleppo and it got, as you know, it just even their historical artifacts got just totally destroyed during the war. Now I ask, um, I'm gonna go back one more time. I asked um, uh, NASA if I could have access to the Ukrainian photographs to take the same example of a before and after, but it's interesting to say they were very kind about it, but they said they've been embargoed because both the DOD and our intelligence agency want to embargo all those photographs now while so much is going on. So we can't see that. But here's one more thing we can see before and after. This time I want you to look down here at Baghdad. So the southern part of Iraq has always been the relatively safe area, the green area of Iraq. So watch what happens here on your left. And look now at Baghdad. And what we're going to see is the flow of refugees and immigration. Very pronounced. And we see this in a way we don't see any other way but by looking at Earth at night from space. And you have to remember that the astronauts see the world, a sea of sunrise and a sunset 17 times every 24 hours. That's how often they circumnavigate the globe. And so they watch this, they get their cameras ready, and then they photograph it. Another thing we see is history. You may remember in 1962, John F. Kennedy said, I will not have Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles 90 miles from the United States of America. I want to show you where you are here. You know this is Miami. Here's Tampa, St. Pete, or there is a uh, Disney World, and here are the keys. And right here is Havana, Cuba. And the missiles were going to be based right in this area here, and a second battery here, 90 miles from the United States. John F. Kennedy said it's not going to happen. The Cuban Missile Crisis we see at night. We also see the consequences of, I don't know how else to put it, but I just call it oppression. You know, here we have the Korean Peninsula by day. Uh, you all recognize the shape, South Korea, North Korea, China up here. Watch North Korea at night. It virtually disappears. This is North Korea. Here's the DMZ. Here's Seoul. And here's South Korea. We're going to take another look at it here. Here's China up here. Again, we'll look at North Korea at night. Almost nothing. Here is North Korea up here. Here's the DMZ, and here's Seoul. Now there's one spot of light that was consistently there, visible in all the pictures I saw of, of the Korean Peninsula. Here it is again, this one spot of light, there's the DMZ, South Korea. You see these little white spots down here? Those are fishing vessels because in this part of the South China Sea, they use lights to bring fish up to the surface. In any event, there's this one dot of light here in the center of North Korea, which is the ultimate vanity, it is the Tower of Juche, which is to commemorate Kim Sung Il. That's not a democracy. That is a one, a very unusual part of the world. We also see at night how Jurassic our, pl our planet can be. Here we are in this beautiful facility in the middle of Louisville, Kentucky, with streets and everything's aligned and perfect. And we're going to go out and have dinner later on. But oh, by the way, about five miles underneath of the mantle, we have a very active and alive planet. This is the South. Pac this is the Pacific Ocean. I looked at these pictures for about three months, and then one morning, this one evening, this picture, this little dot popped up. I had no idea what it was until the next morning. I read about the eruption of the Kileue volcano in Hawaii that was so powerful that the lava was visible from space. And as they say here, it could fill 100,000 pools. The, um, the Earth photography from space at night has other aspects to it. There's a reflective nature of the lights from the planet. And in this photograph, we see how the atmosphere catches that light. Do you see that? And we see how really fragile and eggshell thin this atmosphere is. I'm going to give you a different angle of it right here. Look at the, look at the uh, ratio of the size of the planet to this really thin 30-mile atmosphere that sustains all life on our planet. Little wonder we want to protect that ozone layer, something we see very dramatically at light. One of the fun things we see are great distances, particularly in the United States where we have such concentrations of populations. Uh, we don't see this by day. Uh, does anybody have any idea what part of the United States we're looking at? 
This is the eastern seaboard. In fact, this is the I-95 corridor. So over here, we have clouds on the Atlantic Ocean. This is the I-95 corridor. So let's, let's see what we're looking at. This is uh, Virginia Beach and Norfolk. Over here is Richmond. We'll start going up 95 to Washington. And if you're in Washington, what's the next city? That's right. And then, and then, and New York City, and then all the way up through Connecticut to Boston. And we can even see some of Canada up here. One view, about a third of the Eastern seaboard and one end to the other. Here's another view of the same area. We're right over New York City. Here is New York down here. Here's Philadelphia, it's a little bit cloudy. There's Baltimore and Washington. We're gonna look over the Shenandoah Valley, all the way here to Cleveland, Detroit, and one view from New York all the way up here to Chicago. And Louisville is probably somewhere up here, and we're going to see Louisville on another slide. These slant range photographs were, are, are, are in and of themselves somewhat historic. This is kind of interesting. Does anybody know what we're looking at here? This is Florida. Here's Miami, Tampa, St. Pete, Orlando, and so on. What's interesting about this photograph is it looks pancake, excuse me, it looks pancake flat. In fact, and this picture really illustrates it, the highest elevation in Florida, and we can see it now, is 378 feet. No wonder Florida is so susceptible to the oceans and to the weather. Now, this is for some of my friends here from New Orleans. Uh, this is our southeastern United States. It's a little bit difficult to see because I couldn't find a good one to give you the full picture. But part of what we see is how the habitation of the United States started to follow interstates, or maybe I should say it differently, that our interstates started to follow the footpaths, which followed the dirt roads, which followed the two lanes, which became our interstates. But what we have here is I-10 going across to the Crescent City. Now we know why New Orleans is called the Crescent City. Over here to Mobile, I-10 to Houston. Then we go up 35 to Dallas. We come across 20 to Jackson, Mississippi and back down here. And again, this is New Orleans. Now we're gonna take another look at New Orleans and, and kind of dig down into why we call it the Crescent City, right? There it is. And New Orleans is backed up by the lake, it, but it looks like it embraces the lake, right? But it actually doesn't, it has its back to the lake. It faces the Mississippi River. And this white area is, of course, an urban core. It's a dense population area. We'll see what that looks like in, during the day. And there it is, there is the urban core of New Orleans. There's the Mississippi River. And as you know, when Katrina came, it had this tidal surge that went in and flooded the city, but then it whacked right into the lake, which then pushed it back out. So New Orleans essentially was flooded twice by the hurricane, and we can see it here. There's, you know, entire countries visible from space. And no, you have to really kind of be lucky to figure out what they are. This looks like, I don't know, um, a, 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 an octopus or a, it's just, it was like an other, it was like something from a, a movie, an alien movie. And I kept looking and looking and looking and trying to figure out where these mountains, where these water, is this big, is this little, is this an island like Bermuda? Turns out that was Osaka and there was Tokyo Bay. So I zoomed down in on Tokyo Bay to get a better look at it. And I saw all this jagged stuff on Tokyo Bay, which at first confused me. But if you think about it, it's landfill. You know, like all countries, like the Netherlands, they reclaimed Tokyo Bay. And on these orange lights in Tokyo Bay, on these jagged teeth of Tokyo Bay, these orange lights are piers, wharfs, harbors, our airport. There's a university that's built on Tokyo Bay and all sorts of other kind of industrial construction of the city. This is Tokyo. But here we have that characteristic white concentration, which means a dense urban area. But look at that dark spot right in the middle. What do you suppose that is? Does anybody know Tokyo? The, forbi the, for the Forbidden Palace, the Palace of Edo, right here in the middle of Tokyo, built in 1878, that little dark spot visible from space. So we also had this fun thing, at least to me it was, I call it the unintended art of humankind's habitation of Earth. That's a mouthful. But this looks like to me, you know, with a little bit of squinting, it looks like a man up here with a big hat on and he's riding an ostrich and he's got a uh, reins here. And here's the ostrich and it's actually Abu Dhabi. 
This one too is kind of fun. At least it was to me. To me, it was an Incan or a Mayan Indian. And, you know, he had a, a breastplate and a headdress. And I don't know, he had a, his own little you know, lasso going. Maybe it was a centaur uh, with a tail. But this breastplate seems so interesting to me. It seems so clearly Mayan or Incan. It turns out that it's built in the center of Brazil. As you may remember, Sao Paulo, which has 12 million slash 20 million in population, very crowded. Rio de Janeiro is very crowded. So in the 1950s, they did what? They moved the capital of Brazil to the inland, uh, to inland, and it, they created a city out of nowhere called Brasilia. Now, if you look at this, this interesting arcing is actually what it is. When the city by day, it is surrounded by these lakes, which creates this image of this breastplate of the Mayan Indian at night. Some odd little facts. We're kind of getting to the halfway point here. Some odd little facts um, by day from space. There's virtually no sign of human habitation whatsoever. This is New York City. Long Island, New York City, the three islands and a peninsula. Remember that? Queens and Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, and Long Island. Three islands and a peninsula, New York. But no sign of human habitation by day. Does everybody know what we're looking at here? Strait of Gibraltar. Here we have the Iberian Peninsula. Remember, Madrid was built by the king to be an exact geographic center of, of Spain, but we have no sign whatsoever of Madrid or Spain, or here where we have North Africa. Here we have the Strait of Gibraltar right there. That little hook is Gibraltar. Again, no sign of human habitation by day, cold, empty planet. But watch what happens when we see the same Italian peninsula by night. Here we have Naples, Mount Vesuvius. Up here is Rome and Civita Vecchia, the port, and with the boot of Italy. And see this mosaic pattern of cities in Italy? It's something we're gonna see in some other photographs. It's just this kind of fabric look that Italy has at night. But by night, the planet becomes an electric planet and it becomes visible again. So we're gonna play our first game of Where's Waldo. As John said, I have a book over here for whoever gets this city first. I'll use the honor system. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, a big dark area over here, which may well be uh, an ocean or a desert. Here is a large city and another one here. Who said? Who said Boston? That's right. We're looking at Boston here and New Bedford, which is the whaling center of the world back in the day, and over here, the Cape, and we'll look at it by day. There it is, New Bedford, Boston, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket down here somewhere. This one's not gonna be Where's Waddle. This is kind of just more curiosity than anything. This is an alligator pushed up the edge of the Eastern seaboard. It's also called Long Island. Here we have Long Island, Long Island Sound. There's Coney Island right there. Here's Jamaica Bay. We're gonna look up the Hudson River now. We're gonna zoom in a little bit different of an angle. We see it again. Here's the upper bay, the lower bay, New York Harbor. Here's Manhattan, Long Island. Looks like an alligator stuck in there. We're gonna take one more look at it and define some of the other characteristics. Here we have a good view of the Hudson River, right? And the East River here emptying out into Long Island Sound, but that's an incorrect statement, and I'll tell you that in a minute. Here we have the Harlem River, which forms one of the three islands of New York City, Manhattan, Staten Island, and Long Island. I said what I told you was wrong. You know that the harbor and these waterways of New York are tidal estuaries. So that means twice a day, the tide comes in and goes out, and it raises between eight and 12 feet on each inflow and outflow. Now, what you can see is, the tide will come in here from the Atlantic Ocean over here into the harbor and flow up the rivers. That's just commonly known. But what's not as well known is that the tide also comes in from the Atlantic Ocean up Long Island Sound. So the tides come in from two directions in New York and they hit at a Dutch named Hellgate. They hit right here. And during tw twice a day, the captains, when I did my 9-11 book, twice a day, the, the tides are so intense that they create a whirlpool and they become non, it becomes unnavigable. The East River becomes unnavigable right here at Hellgate where the Harlem River, the East River, and uh, the two tides come together and create a whirlpool that's not passable even by boats today in 2022. 
So uh, in the center of New York, we have one other feature. It's dark at night. We'll go back and take a look at that. But from space, we can see Central Park. There it is by night, and there it is by day. So this is going to be another contest, another giveaway for a book. So almost all of you who have been on a cruise ship have been here. Uh, this is uh, that mosaic, that fabric I talked about of the of Italy, this beautiful mosaic of the cities of Italy. We're going to try to identify this. It's an island connected to the mainland by, a, by this long bridge. Here's a kind of a blurry picture of it, but the shape is what should give it away. It's a fish. And by day, what's that? Who said it? Venice. Venice, you got it. So here we see Venice at night, and we'll look at it by day. And we see the Grand Canal right here and the new port. And what we will not see again is this, the sign of a cruise ship being tugged. There's the tugboat over on the far right, being tugged through the, grand, through the canal. That's now stopped. They will now go around and dock. Venice. Okay, we're not going to play Where's Waldo on this, but we're going to really look at this one. This is a major European capital. This is either London, Paris, Moscow, Bucharest, or Budapest. And it has the characteristics of all five of those cities. And let's unpack what that means. So first of all, we find the river. Remember the dark spots? Oops. Let me get that back going. Sorry. We find the dark spots. Here's probably a park where the river continues. And we see a circular shape here, which is very characteristic of Moscow. Moscow is built on radiating circles that go out from the center. So too is Paris, arrondissements. We see the shapes of, but we see there's population on both sides of the river, which is very characteristic of Buddha and Pest. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit here on this dark area. Now we clearly see the rivers, but it doesn't really tell us more, but we do see this circular thing that probably means it's either Paris or Moscow. Both have very similar characteristics with rivers going through them. So we're gonna zoom in one more time to this area here, and we're gonna find enough definition, I think, to define what we're looking at. So we see the river, but we see this round structure out of which radiate streets, which is the Arc de Triomphe, right? And the Champs de Lézée and the Tuileries, and we're gonna zoom in one more time if I don't mess it up, and we'll see here's where the Eiffel Tower is, and over here are the Tuileries, Rue Rivoli, and the Ritz is right there. We're gonna go back here, there's the Arc de Triomphe, and here's the park, and up here is Roland Garros for my tennis playing friends. We're gonna zoom in one more time, and we see the beauty of Hausmann's work between 1853 and 1870 the widening of the boulevards of Paris. So this next one, I'm not gonna ask you to guess because it took me almost a month. I collaborated with a person in Austria who was in Graf Austria, who was this one of these nerds that just totally loved looking at earth at night photographs. And he was a person that we would, we would text each other and email each other. And I'd send him a picture. I'd say, what am I looking at? And he'd say, well, it's Baku. And I'd say, no, it's not. It's, it's San Francisco. And we went back and forth. Peter was his name. And he helped me identify this one. I thought all of these areas here were water. We couldn't find anything to disprove it. What, this had, what we did to use to identify this area were these concave light strips, which turned out to be Copacabana Beach. Beautiful. Um, so this is pretty easy. If you're in Jeddah, you're on the way to Mecca. Here's Jeddah for the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. Jeddah is an amazing city. If you see it by day, the construction is there is nearly continuous. This is not the road to Jeddah, but rather uh, to Mecca, but rather it comes out, right out of here and goes straight across the desert to Mecca. This one, I'm going to give you one clue. There's no prize. Uh, all you need to know is the only city that straddles two continents. What city is that? Istanbul. Absolutely right. So here we have Istanbul. Here we have Europe. Here we have Asia. Here we have the Bosphorus. We're gonna zoom in a little bit, get a better view of it. Here we actually can see the golden horn, right? Sophia, Haga Sophia, right here. And we see the Bosphorus Strait. And we see the bridge, there's one bridge here. And we see a second bridge. 
we're going to actually be able to zoom in, but you can see the blue of the, one of the bridges across the Bosphorus Strait. It is the used to be the third longest suspension bridge in the world behind Mackinac and the Verrazano Narrows, but they just recently opened up the bridge across the Dardanelles, which makes this now the fourth longest. The longest suspension bridge in the world now spans the two sides of the Dardanelles. But here we are in Istanbul. All right, this is a Where's Waldo, our last, last puzzle, our last question, who can get this first? Uh, this is a city. Uh, it looks like a crab claw, but it's not. Uh, these areas are either waterways, mountains, or deserts. I'm beginning to think this is a waterway because these look like bridges. Looks like another bridge here. We're gonna zoom in on this area because remember the white spots are the urban core. We're gonna zoom in on it. It's not a clear picture, not as clear as I'd like it to be. It's San Francisco, who said that? You did, from Salt Lake City. So this is San Francisco. Here is, the, uh, here, here is a, a bridge over to Oakland and back here in the Bay. And then these two dots of light are the Golden Gate Bridge. You can see it from space at night. Okay, we're kind of getting to the midpoint here. I'm not gonna give you more than two clues on this city, but the first clue ought to give it away. This is a city that is at the confluence of two rivers here and here. We see that, one big river. It's not Pittsburgh, it's DC. Who said that? That's right, it's DC. So what we see, even from space, we can see them all right here. The White House, the ellipse, and you know what's on the ellipse? is the Jefferson Memorial. All that visible to our astronauts at night from space. So I'm not gonna, this is Chicago, we all know that. It's on the edge of Lake Michigan. Here's the Navy Pier. Here are the roads that radiate out from Chicago. It was built in the 1870s, or habitated more thoroughly. That became kind of the characteristic of it. We're gonna go around here to Gary, and on our next slide, we're gonna come down I-65. Here is Chicago, it's a little bit stormy. We're gonna come straight down I-65 through Indianapolis and continue on down to Louisville, Kentucky, right there, Bernheim Forest. We're gonna go up 71 to Cincinnati. Then we're gonna peel off and go up 75 to Dayton. Or we're gonna come back to Louisville. Remember how we go up a little bit into the knobs and then we come straight across on 64 to St. Louis. And again, you can kind of see how habitation either grew on footpaths that became roads, or as roads became our primary means of, of, of expansion, how population started living alongside roads, and that is our area with Louisville, Kentucky. This is kind of a puzzling city. Um, it's surrounded by either water or desert, but from space, the astronauts say this is absolutely the brightest point on the planet. It is a city that's in the United States of America. Here are those, here are those runways that we're so used to seeing in the dark areas. Who on earth would build a runway right next to an urban center except for Las Vegas, Nevada. You're right. Okay, so we're kind of coming to the end of the presentation and we're gonna divert a little bit now and kind of summarize things. And we're gonna look at space travel itself and how is it that we get into space? Uh, some of this is a little, it, well, some of this has changed because of Ukraine, but now there is really only one way that we can get into space, we Americans. Uh, it used to be, that we would go up on the Soyuz capsules. And the Russians have this thing of just brute force, just fire them up and crash them down. And they would build their whole launch systems on their side. They put it behind this enormous uh, uh, rail uh, locomotive. They would take it out on the tracks. They didn't care too much about the OSHA rules because they'd have people just walking alongside this enormous booster. They take it out on the side, they would tilt it up into the sky. Again, people just standing right next to it. And then they would fire it off and go into space. A big boost, a big crude, highly powerful rocket launching system that worked really well. We, on the other hand, have Elon Musk. And Elon Musk, and there's nothing wrong with Elon Musk. In fact, when he was deciding to start SpaceX, he went over to Russia and said, can I buy your boosters? Because I don't want to make everything. And they said, sure. And then he got, by the time he got back to the US, he decided against it. And now SpaceX actually fabricates every single piece of the Falcon booster and the Dragon capsule. And here's one launching. And as you know, this will automatically return to Earth with their GPS systems and the reverse rockets, they recover half of that booster. Here's a little bit of a difference between Dragon here on the left, which is SpaceX and the Soyuz capsule. Here are the people in the Soyuz capsule. 
very crowded. Here are four as here are three in Soyuz and four astronauts in Dragon. This isn't a, a mock-up. This is a photograph taken before they tilt forward. You can see they're on springs here. The seats will tilt forward into the instrument panels. That's what Dragon looks like on the inside versus a technology that was developed 30 years ago. Almost all spaceflight today is robotic. Uh, you see these radar receptors here. Uh, this is the Soyuz capsule coming into the space station. Here's the Dragon doing the same thing. They're going to look for these little things on the edge of the space station docking station. They're going to line them up with the ones that they have on their capsule. Here's one, here's the other, here's one, here's the other. And you see this little three-foot gap? It takes about a half hour to close that last three-foot gap for them to close the airlock, for them to dock. And when they dock, the first thing they do is open up a bag of fruit. And the astronauts absolutely love it. And this is astronaut Doug Wheelock, who was one of the participants in the book. Um, one of our other participants, participants in the book was someone you saw earlier who was floating in the cupola. Her name is Sandy Magnus. She's a Navy fighter pilot. And she said, Doug, let me send you down a picture of my crew compartment. And I said, sure. So she did. And here is her laptop. I said, Sandy, I can see your laptop. I can see your makeup bag back there. But where the heck's your bed? And she said, we don't have any beds. We sleep in sleeping bags. It doesn't matter if we're upside down or right side up. There's no gravity. So they sleep in sleeping bags. There's her bed. She sleeps in a sleeping bag. All of them do on the space station. So the last thing I asked all the astronauts is, you know, let's, you know, put aside all the formal training you have. What do you see when you look down at Earth at night from space? And they said, you know, we see those things. We already have biases and prejudice to see as it is. He, she, he said, one of them, Sandy Magnus, says, look, I'm, I'm an environmentalist. I actually do see the footprint of humankind during the day. It's pollution. Here's the Nile, and here's Alexandria, and there's Cairo. I see the pollution of humankind. Don Petit, one of the guys that was taking a picture in the, um, in the cupola, uh, he's a physicist. He said, I see the energy of the planet. Now, you and I see lightning, but they see thunderstorms from above. And we're going to see him in the last little video clip that I'm about to show you. He says, I see the incredible energy of the planet. Doug Wheelock, who you saw bouncing around with those uh, with the new fruit, uh, he, Doug Wheelock's an interesting guy. He's an astronaut, but get this, he's an Army helicopter pilot, a United States Air Force fighter pilot, and a Navy test pilot all in one. He's gone through the different branches, and he is, by the way, a poet but he's also a man of faith. And he said, I see the magnificent handiwork of our almighty and loving God. He just says it like that. And what better picture to show that than this slant range photograph of Greece. And here's the birthplace of democracy. And we can even see the Acropolis right here in the center of Greece. Beautiful, beautiful imagery. So we're about done. We're going to just do two more things. We're going to take a look at Earth as we would see it from 35,000 miles out in space. This is not from the space shuttle, what we're going to see right now. We're going to see how the planet looks if we were an alien coming towards it, and we're going to turn it. We're starting here over um, India and Eurasia, but we're going to rotate it now from Africa all the way around back to Africa. This is what our planet looks like from space. Notice habitation on the perimeters of most of these countries. We're going to take one more look at it. We're going to do a video clip now. We're going to come from the United States out into the Atlantic Ocean, which is going to be cloudy, and we're going to cross the Atlantic Ocean onto the continent of Europe. The first thing we'll see is the UK and the English Channel. Here we are crossing the Atlantic Ocean. There comes the UK and the English Channel. We're crossing the continent now. Italy is appearing on top. Look at the energy of the thunderstorms on the right. We're crossing the Mediterranean Sea, back over here to the Nile again, where we'll stop above the Red Sea. So uh, like that video clip, a journey comes to an end. Our astronauts bid farewell to the Terminator, the divide between day and night. They will crawl into their capsule, crowd into that capsule. They will burn through the atmosphere. When they hit the steps of Russia or land wherever they land, they'll be so weak that they can't support their own body weight. So they'll be taken away from their landing in some sort of chair. 
and they will say to the world what all of us say after being in extreme conditions. They will tell the world, hi, mom. And like our first picture, that's a picture that also was carried by 258 newspapers. And that, my friends, is Earth at Night from Space. Thank you very much. Doug, that was an excellent presentation, informative, educational, and certainly a different view from anything I've ever seen. Thanks so much. So uh, we've got time for a QA. and uh, a and I'll show my bias for those of you that are here. The microphone is yours. Uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask Doug. Uh, are all these photographs uh, zoom in to put them in on screen or were they, uh, that's the actual snapshot that the astronaut had? What this? Yes, please. Sorry. Um, so, so it, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, most of the photographs were just taken without zoom lenses uh, or any uh, other things. They were just as they took them and as they were downloaded uh, at the uh, at, at Houston Space Center. Sometimes I would enlarge them just to show you where we were looking at them. But most of those photographs are as they were downloaded from the space station. And as Jill knows, my wife, Jill Keeney's here. As Jill knows, uh, we were looking at pictures every night for almost a year. Wherever I was, I would be going through another two or 300 photographs that would come down every day. Thank you. You bet. So the question is, is it a harder, more time to do a, this photo illustrated book or to do one of my uh, regular nonfiction books? It's really a toss up. This book took a lot longer than I would normally have expected. I have done another photo illustrated book in the past of D-Day. Uh, and it was done when Saving Private Ryan came out. It was called Day of Destiny. And it was relatively fast to do that book. It had the same number of pictures, same number of pages. But this one was slower because the pictures came down every day. And they just continued and continued. And I just, you know, one, one, one pass of the space station might cover a certain part of the planet. And then a month later, it might have rotated enough to cover another part of the planet. So it took about a year altogether to do the book, I'm guessing. My normal book takes about two years, though. It's pretty long to do a nonfiction book. Thanks, Richard. Doug, I've got a question. Uh, obviously, you uh, have traveled uh, internationally. Uh, tell us uh, something about uh, where you've been, where, what, what area you like the best. And for anybody that's looking for a place to travel, where you would suggest they would go? Uh, that that's a loaded question. <laughs> I think all of us know the answer to that is it's just impossible to reduce life down to a couple of trips. But uh, Jill and I had a great pleasure of going to Istanbul a few months ago, and it was one of the most beautiful places we'd ever been. And then uh, it really, and then three or four weeks ago, we had the great pleasure of going to Yellowstone National Park of all places. We were there the week before all the roads were flooded out. So we got to see Old Faithful and everything else. And I'll tell you the one thing I did notice, John, the one thing, there's such a beautiful, there's such a, uh, a, a you know, Europe has all the history, but we have all the land. And the land is just magnificent in America. So we found that we really love the both areas. We love France a lot, but we loved Istanbul and we loved uh, Yellowstone. Thank you. I just felt, uh... so here's a chat question. Uh, Megan Burnett asks, are the images used for exploring global warming environmental issues? Yeah. So NASA has EOS, EOS, EOES, and it's a satellite, it's a component of the orbiting satellites that is used for environmental studies. It does multiple types of imagery of the planet through infrared and other types of filters that show heat, that show water, that show participation. So while I didn't go into that in any detail, I had to brush up against it. But I think the answer is to that person that uh, they are very active in uh, presenting the environmental consequences that affect the planet through photography and other imagery. So thank you. Uh, Doug, uh, out of the 184,000 images, what process of elimination did you follow to zero in and the number of photographs that you printed 
No, are you? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing was when I originally started the book, my publisher wanted a book that was about 175 pages. It ended up being 264 pages. And the reason it ended up being 264 pages was we decided to add more and more cities as we saw more and more cities come down from the space station. But we also wanted to make sure that it would be the definitive book of Earth at Night from Space that somebody couldn't come on a year later and say, oh, well, Keeney's book didn't cover Africa or Keeney's book oh, forgot about Asia. So we covered virtually all the continents of the world. Uh, but what really de delineated whether we took it, whether it became part of the book or not was the clarity of the photograph. Now there was a section of the book where I wanted to just look at those long panoramics because I felt like those are sort of interesting to be able to see from Chicago to New York in one picture, but largely the cities were what determined whether they were in the book or not. And I will say this, just so you don't, I'm, I'm not a glutton for punishment. Of the 175,000 inch photographs that I did go through, I would say about 50,000 of them were immediately unusable. They were just too blurry, but we would often get a series of 30 photographs that were taken in 30 seconds. Boom, boom, boom. They would just shoot a big string of photographs and it might be the third out of 27 or the fifth or the 20th that would be the one I'd use in that string, but you could tell pretty quickly. Thank you. Doug, tell us, uh, uh something about uh, some of your interactions with the astronauts that you found interesting and that might be of interest to this group. Sure, sure. So we tend to, we tend to, at least I tend to have an archetypical image of an astronaut, not necessarily formed by a Tom Wolf and the right stuff, but also just through, you know, the years that we've all been here together on Earth and heard about astronauts. And the one thing I just kind of assumed that was they really cool pilots, and they almost always were really cool pilots. But what they, what I didn't expect was the degree of education that they all had. I mean, virtually every one of them had a master's or a doctorate or a master's and a doctorate and another doctorate. And then on top of all of that, they had this personality side to them that it would be impossible for me to generalize, but of, of the five of the seven astronauts in the book, uh, six of them were really interested in something odd like poetry <laughs> or needlepoint. You know, this is just not what I think of an astronaut. And that side was as important to them as the PhD, the fighter pilot they used to be, or what we would think of as an astronaut. It was the needle pointing and the poetry. And, uh, oh, the third person loved to build um, uh, with, with small trees that you would trim, these small little... Yeah, yeah, he, he, was a he. he just loved making those and trimming those and, and building little mosaics with all these little trees. So it was that human side that attracted me the most to them and really made them uh, uh, come to life for me. Thank you. Doug, thanks for a very, very interesting and informative travel through space through a different lens. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much.